Well, it's now my pleasure to introduce a woman who epitomizes what this conference is about, who spends literally every day of her life working for and with women and families across the globe to promote human security. Uh, Dr. Noeline Hazer received her education at the University of Singapore and at Cambridge University, where she earned a PhD in social sciences. In 1994, she became the executive director of the United Nations Development Fund for Women, or UNIFEM. And she's the first director of this very important agency from the Global South. Before taking up the directorship uh, at UNIFEM, Dr. Hazer had worked for many years in various capacities on issues of gender equality and development. She'd been a policy analyst to Asian governments and had worked extensively at the national level on development policy and programs. She had also engaged in widespread work at the local and community level with women migrant workers, women who worked in the informal sector and on plantations, young women who worked in sex work, and women workers in free trade zones. For a time, she was a textile worker in a free trade zone where she organized women workers and helped trade unions contend with issues of gender inequality and exploitation. She was a founding member of regional and international networks, including the Development Alternatives for Women for a New Era, Dawn, the Asia Pacific Women in Law and Development, and ISIS International. And she was responsible for instigating the first NGO plan of action for the 1995 FWCW, involving over 1,000 organizations from the village level to region, regional networks. In her role at UNIFEM, Dr. Hazer has promoted women's human rights, economic security, and political participation within a context of feminized poverty and globalization. She's advocated strongly for a UN agenda more keenly focused on the elimination of violence against women. And presently, she's turned the fund's work towards advancing a women, peace, and security agenda to make women and gender perspectives central to the peace process. She's also a distinguished scholar her principal publications, I'm not even going to list all of them, but they focus on many of the same issues that she's uh, worked on in terms of community work. Last year, she received the 2003 Women of Distinction Award by the NGO Committee on the Status of Women. And the chair of the executive board of that uh, organization said of her, we celebrate her commitment to women's groups around the world and her leadership in shaping emerging issues trafficking in women and girls, empowerment of women in society, prevention of HIV AIDS. She's a mentor to many women and a tireless supporter of women's rights. Dr. Hazer was in Liberia two days ago meeting, uh, meeting with and working on issues of displaced people in the disarmament camps. And she's off to Seoul at the beginning of next week. I had the opportunity to spend a little time with her today. And for a woman who spends much of her work life flying across the globe, particularly to conflict zones, she could not be more grounded. She's a leader who's absolutely tuned in to everything around her, who appreciates and connects with diverse peoples, with the natural world, with brilliance and a huge heart. Dr. Hazer has looked into the eyes of women and children who live with realities that cause despair and desperation and done what she can to help give them voice and advocate for their empowerment, participation, and the improvement of their lives. She is a person who inspires hope through her work and from the kind of leadership, kindness, and passion that she exudes. Please join me in thanking her for being here and sharing her wisdom with us this evening. Thank you very much, Sandy, for the very, very kind words. And good evening, everyone of you. It's a real pleasure and honor for me to be here and uh, to share with you some of my thoughts uh, that Sandy has asked me to, to do. It's a very special occasion because it's not often that I take time off to be with people in universities. And sometimes you realize what is it you're missing uh, in, in an environment that is so beautiful. But let me start by saying that um, in today's world, in a globalizing world, one thing is extremely clear, and this is that our lives are so intertwined. Our lives and our destinies are so intertwined in such a way that decisions that are made in Washington, in New York, in Geneva, will have impact even in the, some of the most remote areas of our world today. 
But at the same time, decisions that are made even in the most remote caves of the world have an impact in what we think are some of the most secure spaces of our globe, as September 11 has shown us. In other words, what we thought are boundaries that would save us or would protect us, our national boundaries are insufficient. And that local security are very much linked to global security. And that we need to rethink what we mean by human security. And the best way of rethinking what human security is, is to bring in the lives of women and their experiences. And this, in fact, is what I would like to do tonight. When you look at the lives of women and rethink what human security is, it's living lives that are free of violence, free of poverty, and free of discrimination. It means that human security cannot be just based on weapon-based security. Military security alone is not enough. And that we need to look beyond that to new understanding of what security means. And I have to say that the Secretary General of the United Nations, um, when he called together all the heads of states basically said to them that security is unlike any other commodity. It is not like land, it's not, not like gold. It's not the, a situation where the more you have, the less your neighbor has. Security is one of those commodities where the more your neighbor has, the more you will have. In other words, you need to rethink it in entirely different ways. And that the best, the best guarantee of security at this time is a guarantee of security that is based on core values and common understanding, on international norms and standards that really put in place how we use our resources, how we build up sol the solidarity that is needed in terms of international community, one that builds on common grounds. And he called the 191 heads of states to say, we have had, after the Cold War, a dream of trying to bring about a peace dividend, a more peaceful world. But we have not succeeded because on top of globalization, side by side with globalization, are all the fragmentation along the fault lines of ethnicity, along the fault lines of religion, of ideology, and there are so many intra-state was that are stimulated by regional and international interests and that we need to relook at what how do we bring about new sense of security and the best way of investing in human security is to deal with existing inequalities that in fact it is not just the issue of vertical inequalities but horizontal inequalities. Now what do I mean by that? It means it is inequalities among groups, among groups, because group identity have become a political mobilizing tool that people have mobilized around group and turned that into a political force that works against one another. And that can only work if there are great inequalities among groups, among groups, not just between them, not, not just within them. In other words, if you, if, uh, it's, if you look at the community, say, in, in America, where, where you have blacks, it's not just the, the inequalities within the black communities, but it is also between the blacks and the white community. So, so the more that, that rests, the greater the, the opportunity of conflict, right? Now, the best way, uh, that most of these people came to was to come together in terms of a set of goals, what are now called the Millennium Development Goals. What are the kind of goals that we need to put in place in this 21st century that will ensure a reduction of inequalities and will be able to build on a commonality of ethics and values that will lead us to a more human future. And these goals are basically halving the world's absolute poverty by the year 
2015. It is make, making sure that girls and boys have equal opportunities to attend school, that there is gender equality and women's empowerment, that there is the reversal of HIV AIDS, that there is access to clean water, there is an, an environment that is safe and, and healthy. Now all this one would think would be a common way of building a more secure human future. But unfortunately at the time when these goals can be achieved, and in fact the costing of this goal is about 10 billion, there is now said not to be sufficient resources. At the time when we are at our richest, because where are our resources going? It's going to weapon-based security. Hmm? We are spending something like 870 billion a year on military spending. And we do not have sufficient resources to invest in what eventually will lead to human security. Now, I would like to look at human security um, as very much linked with human development and, and human rights. And I don't think that one can look at it without looking at it in that kind of a totality. And how do we ensure, how do we ensure that human security, human development, and human rights interact together to create a more secure future for all in the kind of context that we are living in. Now, what is this context? What kind of a world are we living in in the 21st century? What are the forces that are at stake? And how is that shaping our lives? Well, from what, where I, I have been and what I have seen, there are three interacting forces that we need to look at when we're talking about human security. One is a whole issue of globalization and what that means and how do you shape the, the, the kind of globalization in such a way that it creates economic security for all and reduce the kind of inequalities that I'm, I have spoken about. And that is a big challenge and I will come back to that. The second issue is side by side with the globalization is also the fragmentation that have that have developed in many countries and communities of today's world. And I would also look at what it means to really change and turn around a peace and security agenda. Because in terms of the development money that is going to multilateralism, most of it is going to peace operations. And that today there are something like 17 peace operations, the highest that the UN has ever been involved in. So most of the multilateral money is in fact going to maintain peace and security at the ground level with very great cuts to what is happening in the development front. So we need to look, and I'll come back to examine the global peace and security agenda and how I think we need to change that. And the third, the, the third area is what I call problems without borders. We have functioned, especially after the colonial period, in terms of nation states. And this is our organizing principle in the way we engage with one another in the international community and even in the, in the uh, whole United Nations system. But increasingly the nation state, the borders of the, of the nation state is not sufficient to deal with the problems that we are confronted with as human community. And I call these problems problems without borders. And these would be the spread of HIV AIDS, the issue of ecological crisis, the issue of international migration, of criminality, and, and a whole set of issues that requires more than nation states to handle. It requires a whole new look of how we organize as human community in the 21st century, and I'll come back to that. Let me now go back to the, the first um, uh, whole issue of globalization. Now, what is globalization? What, what is it? And how, how, does it, how do we shape it in such a way that it brings about economic security? If we look at economic globalization, it consists of four different components. It involves the economic architecture that looks at trade and how we deal with the trade agenda. There is the whole WTO issue that all of us are engaged with and you would know a lot of it because it has touched you in a very deep way in terms of your agricultural subsidies, in terms of the opening up of markets and so on. At the end of the day, we need 
to find a trade agenda that makes sense to developing countries. There are many countries that are highly indebted and many countries that cannot compete, that have no way of getting out of the poverty trap. And we need to ensure that these countries are able to engage with a, a trade regime that makes sense to them, that will strengthen the local economies. And this is extremely important. Until you have functioning local economies, you are going to displace people. There are going to be migration, there's going to be conflict, and there's going to be internally displaced people that are susceptible to another kind of economy. And this is the criminal or the mafia economy. So we need to find ways in which people do not live at the margins of economies or do not have no way of actually functioning economically. Now the other whole uh, area of globalization is the kind of capital flows that have taken place. Unfortunately, the way in which profits are being made today is that there is a delinking of investment in human capital or, or in the social investment from the flow of capital. One trillion dollar flows around the world every day to change hands, looking for quick profits. So what you have are capital speculation that have brought down the economies of many countries and the devaluation of many, many currencies. What you have there is a con concentration of wealth in fewer and fewer hands, a missing middle and a deepening of poverty, in other words, a falling of, of the middle class into the poverty working class. And this, in fact, creates increasing global inequalities that, in fact, would stimulate the kind of violence and fragmentation that I've spoken about. So, in other words, we need to bring about the ethics, a very deep corporate ethics of how we do business in the world today. And the third, the third whole area of globalization has to look at the whole issue of investment. It, again, uh, what investment does, hopefully, is to create jobs. But what kind of jobs? We all know that when we look at the work of women, that many women are found in the casualization sector, in the informal sector, in sectors where, where, where their skills are all, or the value uh, which, which they, that's put on them is the flexibility of their work, the cheap labor that, that they provide. And I think that there, is, there has to be a link between the consumer and the producers in a globalizing world, whereby the women who have the money to buy and people who care about what's happening to our globe buy because the products are created in ways that are not exploitative of, of, of labor. So the whole idea of social labeling, ethical markets, ethical ways of consuming, um, ways of partnering and creating alliances is extremely important to make sure that there are ethics in the creation of wealth and that, and that, and that wealth creation, in fact, is done in such a way that it sustains communities and not tear communities apart further. The, the fourth part of economic globalization is, of course, the information technology. And here, it has tremendous opportunities and tremendous challenges as well. Um, it provides new opportunities because many of you know that there are new employments that are being created, but also new ways of linking that can get out of state structures. So, so you create e-democracies, you can create e-campaigns, and we have created tremendous campaigns that have brought alliances of women together to end violence against women. We have done tremendous things, co uh, co connecting women in the Arab world, um, really sharing strategies uh, that, that have worked in terms of life and so on. So there are many ways in using e-campaigns and, and e-democracies. Uh, but at the same time, at the same time, who are the people who would benefit from this new information technology? It would be the young, it would be the people who are educated, it would be the, the ones who have uh, connections, who have time, because time poverty among women is just tremendous. And, and therefore, we need to ensure that, that we make use of this opportunity to include, to include and not exclude and, ma and marginalize further. And what is extremely clear is that it is an economy that builds on the educated. So how do we ensure 
that the, the access to edu education and to quality education would spread around the world. Now, I would like to, from there, to go to the peace and security agenda. And I got very much involved with the peace and security agenda globally um, because all the work that I've been doing on the ground in terms of development fell apart because the gains made can be lost very, very quickly and it can be lost when wars break out, when conflict break out. And in many of the countries that I have been to, the devastation uh, that comes with war, it destroys war, destroys people, it destroys infrastructure, it, de it destroys a future. But more important, as I watch what is happening before my eyes, the battlefields of war have changed, and the, and the people who suffer from war has changed. It's no longer just the soldiers, it's the civilians. And if, in fact, if you compare what happened in the First World War, 15% of the civilians were the ones who were hurt by war. But in, at the end of the, the World War II, it was 65%. Today, it's 80 or 90% are civilians. But beyond that, the nature of warfare itself has changed. The battlefields have gone into our homes, it's gone into our communities, it's gone into our villages. But more importantly, it is the battlefields on the, the women's bodies have become the battlefields of war. That the way in which violence against women have been used, the systematic rape have been used because of the mobilization, as I said earlier, of communities against communities, the political use of identities, one against the other, the generation of hatred by the use of media, that there has been tremendous hatred that has been created based on inequalities, based on exclusion. And, that, and this kind of rape, be it in Bosnia, be it in Rwanda, be it in the DRC, every place that I've gone to, it repeats itself over and over again. And this rape is, and this violence and, uh, is not just to hurt the women. It is a violence that is used by men from the other side to destroy the men of, of the enemy. And it's also used to make sure that communities cannot revitalize themselves for the future. And, and this, this whole um, process of, of destruction before my eyes made it very clear to me that we had to change the peace and security agenda. Because up to then, up until we, we as UNIFAM, um, together with the women's group, until we took this issue on, Security Council did not see women as part of the peace and security <coughs> equation. Right? They saw it very much, again, as a military uh, complex. It was a peacekeeping operation. It would have peacekeepers. But what have women got to do with peace and security? And, and when we brought it to the attention of the Security Council, the first reaction was, we already have a resolution on civilian protection, so why do you need one on women? And we had to tell them that women are not just victims. Because the other picture that I saw was the fact that despite the destruction at the community level, despite the tearing of the social fabric of life, it was women who dared to cross the boundaries, that dared to cross the borders of ethnicity, that dared to try and create new communities of hope, that tried very hard to keep, to keep the, 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 the level of the violence down. And, that, and in many of the countries that I visited, be it from Rwanda or be it from, from DRC, what was extremely clear was that they were the last threshold of hope. And that when they were broken because of the level of violence, their children become soldiers. And therefore you had a whole phenomena of kidnapping of children, including girls, into fighting forces. So it is not a case of just kidnapping the girls as sex slaves, but the girls were made to kill. And I was in Liberia just uh, two days ago, and I went to the DDR site, and this is the disarmament and demobilization, and the R stands for rehabilitation, and there's another R that stands for reintegration. So let me just take that, because that's very, very interesting. The disarming uh, of the combatants is the first, when a country signs a peace accord. And when they sign a peace accord, the first thing that has to happen is a disarming process. You have to disarm 
your combatants. And so, so very up to up to that time when when we took uh, brought forth a, a women, peace, and security resolution. This is called a Security Council Resolution 1325. Nobody thought that they need to do this DDR from a perspective of women. And so, what they would happen would be it would be the male ex-combatants who would be uh, taken out of the jungle and disarmed. But all the women and the girls who were in the, this, in the fighting forces were totally forgotten. And it was in this, this resolution forced people to rethink who were your fighting forces. And it was very sad for me to see young girls, children themselves, having children in the jungle, fighting, and now coming out, giving up their arms. But how are they going to be reintegrated? The whole issue of stigma and, and shame is with and because these are girls who have killed as much as, as, as soldiers who, who who have killed. And and, and it's extremely devastating to, to 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 hear them speak and to and, and basically to also discover that 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 many of them have been drugged in such as children, they were drugged in such a way that they could kill in the most horrible of ways. And this I think was was a shock that 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 many people had. And how do you rehabilitate a whole population uh, of people who have been involved in this kind of, of atrocities? I uh, want, want to say that one of the things that we, uh, got Security Council really interested was the fact that, uh, that we brought to them uh, women from these conflict zones to meet with them. And for the first time, I think they saw them not just as victims, but as part of the solution. Because most of, of, the, of the women whom we brought were organizing women in the, in the DDR process. They were women who were trying to, to strengthen the organization of communities so that uh, communities could exist, uh, trying to make sure that markets were operating, trying to make sure that health, little health systems were, were working. So suddenly they saw these as the building blocks of the future. But at the same time, I was very sure that what I didn't want was them to take all these people for granted. So because up to now, international community were very, very happy and very secure, bringing warlords to the peace table and never women. And therefore, we had to break that pattern and say, bring the women who have brought these peace in the communities to the peace table. So what we did was we tracked, now of course we can't track every, every peace accord, but we tracked as many peace accords as we could. And for every one of them, we would try uh, to bring women or help them organize and bring them to the peace table. And very often people would ask me, what difference does it make? And frankly, I, I say that it's not what difference it, it, uh, they they actually would, would make, but that it is their right to be at the peace table. But even having said that, they have made tremendous difference. Let me give you some, some examples. In the, um, in, in the Burundi peace process, when um, Nelson Mandela allowed us to facilitate uh, bringing women to the peace table, immediately the peace accord uh, changed. Women put in issues of land inheritance, they put in issues of rape babies, of trauma, of, of how do you do uh, peace uh, and also uh, truth and reconciliation work. So all kinds of issues that never before was put onto the peace table were put at the peace table. But equally important was what happened in the DRC, the Sun City process, which we helped to kind of facilitate. For a while, everyone was saying to me that these militias were not getting on um, together. And, that, and that, that women were the glue for many of, of these processes because they were sharing stories with one another in terms of what is it the other side had problems with that could not be negotiated. But these women had to be supported and we were, we were there for them. But increasingly, I also find that one thing is to have the peace accord, but peace is very fragile and there's no guarantee that once you have the peace accord, it will be implemented. And that what is so important is to make sure that women are in, engaged in the reconstruction process. Because out of the crisis, there are tremendous opportunities, and I can share with you some of, the, of what these opportunities are. The Afghanistan is a very, very good case in point. For many, many years, uh, women under the, the Taliban uh, uh, were screaming for help, but nobody 
heard their voices. They screamed loud and clear, but nobody reacted because it was, it was their problem. It was a problem that was out there. And it needed September 11 and the media to shake the whole world up. And what did we learn from that event? What was extremely clear was that the violence in women's lives and was a big indicator of the level of insecurity in the country, or what was what it was an indicator of national security, the level of national security, and 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 immediately when when um, the opportunity uh, appeared, I took it upon myself uh, to work with Ambassador Brahimi, who was then the SRSG, the Secretary General's uh, Special Representative uh, for the country to help with how um, the reconstruction with women would take place. And I have to tell you that his first reaction to me was not very positive. He said, for heaven's sake, stay away, uh, because I have such a complicated problem to handle. I have to bring all these warlords together into a political process, and you want to bring women? Uh, <laughs> uh, you will just complicate the whole political process. Uh, uh, furthermore, you know, uh, uh, you are more accessible to the diaspora, to the more educated women in Kabul, what you know of the rural women. And, and furthermore, uh, uh, the, the whole thing is so complex. Uh, it is, you have to look at the culture of the place, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, so, uh, the, so towards the end, I, I, I basically ha had to say to him, I said, um, the, if you can bring diaspora men back, there's, we have to make sure that we also can bring the diaspora women back to engage. And that and if you can look for educated men to be part of the reconstruction of the country, there's, we need to make the best use of the educated women from this country. But, and so we pulled together as much as we could, um, uh, women to come to the table to form a national agenda. But it was only when I went to Kabul, and I went out of Kabul, and I, we, we organized 1,000 women for International Women's Day, and before that to come up with a national agenda that he took notice. So suddenly, it was not just an agenda for the educated women or the privileged women, but it was a consultation at the village level, it was a consultation, and in all the provinces, it was a, a consultation that for the first time was able to break out of clans, of the clans in which these people were organized in and whose loyalty was number one, actually. So it was not, they were to, to get people out of thinking in terms of the boundaries of clan to think in terms of, of, of a national uh, plan of action was something that was uh, revolutionary for, for many people, but they felt, especially for women, that that was a much higher stake. And out of that, we um, assisted very much with the training of women to help with the election of the, uh, of the uh, transitional loyal jilga, and then now with the constitutional loyal jilga. And if somebody had said to me, even two, two years ago, that, that the way we have organized women, including the lawyers and the judges, that all that will lead to the fact that Afghanistan today will have a constitution that recognizes the equal right of men and women, and that women's right would be a part of that constitution, I wouldn't have believed. And today, that is what we see. And for the first time, he has believed it. Now, uh, Ambassador Brahimi is a dear friend, and, and, <laughs> and he has gone to Iraq. He, he is now in Iraq, and, and uh, where, uh, I met him several times, and the first thing he asked for me, so are you helping the women? And of course we say yes, and I have won. In fact, when the, I, I was supposed to have gone to, to Baghdad uh, in August last year, um, but the day that I was leaving, the UN office was bombed. So, uh, and I was going to go because we had organized 450 women along the same lines to have a national women's symposium. But that never happened because of the bombing. But everyone, because of the way uh, the, the, the uh, UN was attacked, the Secretary General took out most of the staff. But my national staff continued working. And, and she is such a hero because she kept that 450 women under the radar screen organizing. And when some of them came to see me in March at the Commission on the Status of Women, what they said was that, thank you for supporting Basma, that is her name, 
for, for so, and, and allowing her to support us because it was only through her help that we were able to overthrow um, the Article 137 that was going to come into the Constitution to reinstate or, or to, to create Sharia law that will, uh, that in other words, the, the re-emergence of family law and personal law that was not even there. Uh, before in a particular way and they crushed that but at the same time these women were also able to put in a quota system demanding that in the in the uh, elections that are being prepared that they will have a quota of 25 percent but both of them come in, uh, came, came to me to, uh, to, to say frankly now we don't know what to do because how do we ensure that even with this quota that the UN will take us seriously, um, uh, uh, and that and that we know what because we do, frankly don't even know what democratic uh, elections mean. So how do we understand the electoral system? So 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 we uh, we arrange meetings with them with the Department of Political Affairs. We we send we we told them that, that the electoral framework was extremely important. The way the electoral uh, the the kind of commission that is being set up is very very important. But now when uh, whenever Ambassador Brahimi goes to Iraq, he meets with these women. And I, the emails that I've gotten from the last few days before coming was that he has met them. There were hundreds of them that came to, to that he consulted with and he listened to. And, and this woman was able to get them from all parts of the country. But there was the other side of her email, and which basically said that I'm doing this in the most insecure of condition because there are bombings happening. We have no water. We have no no electric uh, kind of electricity. It's extremely dangerous, and but but we are going forward because that's the only hope we have. We hope that this is something that can happen. So so this work is, has been extremely difficult on many many fronts. But the other um, opportunity in post crisis work are the new institutions that are emerging, and I would like to go uh, from the Middle East to. Africa to the Great Lakes to show you what are some of the changes that can happen if we look at peace and security agenda in different eyes. And one of the best things that have happened in Rwanda after the genocide, we, uh, the UN was implicated in that as many of you know, but UNIFEM went in and was there from the very start from 1994. And the first thing we did was to set up a women's forum in the National Assembly to review all discriminatory laws. And the one of the first thing that the, Rwanda, the, 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 the new government did was to change the law of inheritance, especially the, the, the law to land, the right to land. And that immediately allowed women to revitalize the agricultural sector because most of them had lost their husbands, their brothers, their, their, their sons, and, that, and they were needed to revitalize the food security sector. And, that, and, 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 and when that was done, they were able to engage. And we continued to build up their leadership and help them participate in new and emerging institutions. I'm very happy to say that with all that support, it took 10 years, but something remarkable has happened in the country. Today, if I were to ask you, um, I, and this is something I also wouldn't have believed, even up to one and a half years ago, if, if we had said, which country in the world have the highest level of women in parliament, it would always have been a Scandinavian country. It would have been Norway, it would have been Denmark, it would have been the Netherlands, it would have been Germany. Today, it is Rwanda at 49%. <laughs> <laughs> And I have to tell you that uh, when I was last there, uh, something happened because that's where I learned. You know, a lot of people ask me, uh, some of the, this work is extremely difficult work. And I said, yes, it is very difficult work. But at the same time, I learned some of my deepest, profound lessons from the ground. And, and um, I learned uh, during my last visit there, uh, I, I worked, I, I, the last meeting that I had were, were with the widows who had survived the genocide, and many of them um, were infected with HIV/AIDS as a weapon of war. So they were they were not they were living dead basically. They were dying, and they and, and they knew that. 
um, and uh, they didn't have any money to buy the drugs because it was so difficult. That's why uh, the, the way in which the trade agenda works and the, internet, the, the intellectual property right laws function under the trade agenda is so important because it means that some of the poorest people will have access to the AIDS drugs. And, and if you look at what has happened to the AIDS epidemic because of war, because of conflict, it, is, it has devastated, it has devastated tremendously the villages and the lives of many people. And, and in fact, the figures are really, really scary. And this is something that we need to look at when we talk about human security. In fact, in sub-Saharan Africa, the age group between 15 to 24, the girls and the young women of that age group are infected five to six times more than boys of that age group. And, 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 and this is a tr is, has a, a lot to do with the level of violence, with marriage patterns, with the kind of insecurity, the trading of sex for food. It is, it's really devastating. Anyway, when I was meeting uh, with, with these widows, um, they, they asked for help because they wanted to buy eight drugs. And, and, uh, and I asked them how much would it cost. They, they, they gave me a cent, uh, 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 the cost and so on. And I, and, and I knew that they didn't want charity. It was, not, it, it was not good enough that I went to raise the money, gave it to them, and they would buy these drugs. So I told them, I said, show me uh, what is it uh, you, 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 you do. Uh, tell me a little bit more about uh, why, why uh, uh, the, the kind of lives you are leading now and so on. And, and then they began to tell me the most amazing story. They told me, they said that 50 of them came together and they, from the Tutsi and the Hutu site, and they started crying, they shared the story of devastation, what happened to their families, what happened to them, what happened to their husbands, and so on, and just relived the whole genocide. And they cried and cried, and there was a point where there was no more tears to cry, and they basically said, they said, you know what? There are all these children, we have lost all our children, but there are all these children that have AIDS, orphans, the children of genocide. Let us not ask whether they're Tutsi or they're Hutus. Let us just adopt them as our children. So these were the people who were living with HIV AIDS, were adopting these orphans, that were making new families, and were creating a tremendous future. And, 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 and for me, I mean, the, the, the level of transformation that a person had got to go through in order to do that was so ph phenomenal that for me, that was what peace was all about. And I began to tell th that, that story. And then I also asked them, I said, what do you produce? And they, they told me that they, they did these baskets. So I said, all right, you know what? Let's create a, a, a niche market for you. Let's call this the peace basket. And let's open up the US market for you. So I went back, came back to New York, got all the CEOs of some companies in, uh, that, uh, which I knew, and they have opened up tremendous uh, markets for these widows' baskets, yeah. called, called the peace baskets. And today, each of those baskets sell for about 50 US dollars, and I was told that the widows have directly in their hands 100,000 within the course of, of a year. And, 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 that, and now they can at least begin to survive in a slightly different way. One, I, I'm telling you the story because sometimes it is, it, we can't wait for local markets to, to emerge on, on their behalf and that we have to try to see how can we help with the revitalization very quickly by opening up some of the international markets and that we can do it in, in different ways. And I recently just came out of Liberia and I saw, I saw the scale of human devastation because 1.3 million people are displaced, internally displaced and, behave, and, and, and are surviving as refugees. There is no community to reintegrate into, there are no economies to, 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 to bring the, the kind of combatants to. So I, I told you that there was a DDRR. So the DD is the disarmament and the demobilization, but there's no RR, there's no rehabilitation that is taking place and there's no reintegration because there's no community to reintegrate to and there's no economy to reintegrate to. And it was not by surprise that the moment I arrived back in New York, I was told that a new riot had broken up in the camps. And they had broken out in the camps because there was not, where are these people? After five days of rehabilitation, they are put out in the, in the communities again, and there's no jobs, and there are no resources to kind of support them. 
So, so, so it's very easy for them to go into criminal networks. And so you can't break that cycle of violence until you have something else. And therefore, the need to create these economic security and, and alternative economies that are more competitive than criminal economies and it's more, more viable than the trade in small arms and drugs. That's extremely important. And, the, and, and for women, I mean, one of the things that I saw, I arrived uh, in the country around uh, 12 midnight or so because my plane was, was, was late. And it was supposed to have been cur uh, the time of curfew so I, I went through this long drive uh, to, the, to the hotel, and somewhere along the line, I thought I was overexhausted. I saw young girls running around right? um, um, in very scanty clothes. So the first group I saw, I thought I was overtired. Then the next group tried to stop my car. Right? So I knew that these young girls were, the only way they can survive is through prostitution. And, 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 and that is how these countries are surviving, and that's how you have the spread of HIV AIDS. And it is a human crisis. It is a human crisis until we do something. And um, I want to quickly end by looking at the other side, uh, which is the problems without borders. And here I will talk about two, two things. One is the HIV AIDS, and the other one is the, is the international migration that I know you will also be, be looking at. Now, with the HIV AIDS, I have constantly felt as I work with all these communities that HIV AIDS as a disease is a health issue, but as an epidemic, it is a gender issue. Because women, until you have the status of women improve in the world today, you're not going to have the kind of power to negotiate negotiate safe sex, in, in, uh, negotiate um, uh, a life uh, that is based on human security because you do not have the possibility and, and you do not have the opportunities. And therefore, that is the crisis. But at the same time, as, as I said before, the treatment is a major concern as well. The access to, to, to the cheap drugs is, is a major concern. But in many of these countries where it, it hurts the most is the countries that are highly indebted. And most of the countries that are highly indebted and who have to keep on paying their debts, there are no healthcare systems. The whole healthcare system and, uh, have broken down. And so what has happened is that women become your healthcare system. Now what does that mean? It means that, first of all, because of the, of the HIV AIDS crisis, you have in many villages the very old and the very young, and there is a missing productive sector. And out of that productive sector, the women of that sector are pulled out to be the healthcare system to take care of the sick and the dying. And what happens is a collapse of that productive sector. And this came out very, very clearly uh, when uh, in the in the South African country, the South African countries that we were working in, there was a terrible famine that that happened there recently that many of you would remember. And all of us thought that it was a food crisis until we went in and we realized that the crisis was there because the women farmers were taking away from their farms to care. In other words, it was an HIV/AIDS crisis, and that and that and then until we could address that the productive sectors were not going to operate again. And what, what also happened is the fact that many of these women, because they had to take care of the sick and the dying, would also pull their daughters out of school. So even when we have the best goals, like the Millennium Development Goals that I told you about, that want to put the girls in school, until we get our economics right, until we get uh, the, 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 our social sector right, until we get the communities going again, these girls are not going to school. Uh, even if we say that that is the goal that we want to achieve. And, 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 and it is extremely important that we look at these issues, as including the, what we now call the care economy, as something that needs to be invested in. At the end of the day, uh, I think my, my critical message is that there are every crisis has produced a lot of human suffering, terrible pain, but it also produces opportunities for very profound change. And I think that HIV, and the same way as I said, uh, in terms of the, of the economic uh, area, it, it, 
it needs us to rethink how we do our work economically. How do we generate wealth in such a way that is ethical, that, is, that, 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 that encourages human security? That is one, one way of looking at it. In the, in the peace and security arena, we need to look at new opportunities for, for bringing uh, a, a more inclusive uh, group of people onto various agendas and to change that peace and security agenda. Um, and, and to address it in, su in such a way that uh, we have that the failed states become states that are functioning in a, not just in a democratic way, because a democratic rule of law means the rule of law of the majority, but a more inclusive state that means that it re takes in everyone from the margins, including and especially the minorities, so that they can participate. And so the, it means re-looking at our politics. So one is a re-look at our economics, the other one is a re-look at our politics and the way we engage. And, and, the, and the third one, the third one, the, the crisis of, of HIV AIDS for me is a tremendous crisis to deal with gender inequality because for the first time it's extremely very clear to all of us that gender inequality is not just an issue of social justice or a moral issue, but it is fatal. It is fatal and it's killing. It is killing our women and our girls until we deal with the structures, the structures of gender inequality. And finally, I want to deal with the issue of uh, international migration. Because what, as, inter, as I talked about the, the, the shift, the easy shift across borders of the trade regime, the, the investment, the capital and the information technology, what is not moving in the same way as the movement of labor, the <coughs> movement of people. And yet, people are on the move more than at any other time because of the crisis. As I told you, uh, there are many internally displaced people. There are many refugees that are crossing boundaries. There are many trafficking networks that, that are, are, are operating. And that, and, and, and that there are two kinds of people flow in terms of labor that, that our globalization encourages. One that is not at all problematic and that's often re referred to as the, bl the brain drain is the, the circulation of very skilled people, especially for the new economies. And, and so you find very skilled people, say from India, coming in to, to fit into the, the, the new economies here, the investment bankers and so on. So those people are highly welcomed and very, very much needed. But then there is the underbelly, the, the unskilled uh, workers that are very much needed, but nobody wants to really address them uh, properly. These are the, the people uh, where the economies in terms of the garbage, uh, the, 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 your restaurants, your construction work, and so on. And most of these people would come in, including the, uh, the uh, women who work as, as, as kind of household help. And these women, uh, people would come in, and um, some of them would come in kind of legally, but many of them would come in illegally as well. And, and, there are, and with that illegal frame comes the lack of human rights protection for the way they move. And here, they, there is a very thin line between the illegal migration and trafficking. And until we get it right, until we as a global community realize that there are work that, uh, that uh, there are different kinds of work that none of us would be doing as citizens, and therefore to allow the safe passage of these people to come in to do that work legally and with protection, you are going to have this blurring, a uh, blurring of lines between the illegal uh, uh, movement of people and that trafficking that all of us are very, very um, upset about because it is an indication of criminality. And, that, and, and one of the ways of dealing with that is precisely the recognition of illegal migrants. And I, I, I say this because um, the, I've also seen how vulnerabilities have led to tremendous um, uh, uh, criminal networks. And, and it's very often uh, a criminality that, not, that doesn't deal just with the trafficking of people, but very often it will come together with, with guns and with drugs. And, 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 the, and what was extremely, and very often pornography as well. And I, I just want to end by, this, by saying that what this, I got this very, very clearly when I was asked by the Mexican government to go to Ciudad Juarez. And I think some of you know, know what, what happened there. This is a border town uh, in, along the, Me the Mexican border. And this was where um, 
80% of all migrants would come to um, from Central America and they would be there um, either to work in the Maquila Doris or to come in as illegal migrants into the United States, either into the agricultural sector or, or into the, 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 uh, the uh, uh, kind of vineyards or, and, and so on. And, 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 be, and what was uh, upsetting there was the, the killing of the 300 women who, were, who went missing and whose bodies were found scattered over the whole desert. And it was extremely violent. So I was asked to try and stimulate and bring media attention to, to, to these cases. And with investigation and meeting with the victims' families and so on, um, what we, I found was really the coming together of all these criminal networks. And that, and that, and that, and that at the end of the day, I mean, we have to come in, as the Secretary General said, to be an, in, an international community. You know, what is it? How do we strengthen ourselves in ways whereby the alliances, uh, we, we, we have to know that in today's world that we cannot isolate ourselves. We ca there is no way in which our borders will protect us. So how do we come together to, be, to strengthen in terms of the core values, the core ethics, and the, and the alliances? Because at the end of the day, what will protect us in terms and bring about human security is solidarity. It's a solidarity and commonality of purpose. And working together as one in order to create a more secure future. And I just want to end uh, with, um, with uh, really looking at uh, the idea of, in, of community. I mean, very often when we think of communities, because that's where human security lives, if we think of community, very often it has been because of locality or because of ethnicity and so on. But I think in today's world, we are asked to be more than our communities, uh, local in terms of geography. We are asked to be more than our ethnicity. We are asked to be more than our class. We are asked to go beyond all borders, if you like, to think of ourselves as international community. And, and if you look at the word community, it means common unity. And what is it we have a common unity for? It's a common unity because we only have one world. And until we celebrate that one world and keep that safe, there's no human security. Thank you. Dr. Hazer is willing to take some questions, and I'm sure some of you have some, and maybe we can do this for 15 minutes or so? You have that much? Okay. I'll let you, unless you want me to call. Okay. Hmm. Well, you don't have to ask questions. Okay. Uh, I could They're just trying give, to. Give me some of your comments, your thoughts. Yeah. The talk. <laughs>
the power that rely on the kinds of divisions that you're talking about to begin to come into the conversation that you ended with, that notion of sort of the common unity, to see that there is, that this is something that we, we and, and I'm not saying they are necessarily going to change on their own free will, but what, what kind of dialogue needs to happen with economic elites and to economic elites to make real human security viable? Okay, uh, I saw a couple of hands, so maybe I should let me take a, <laughs> yeah, a, a few. No, <laughs> I, I'm not running away, uh, Sandra, from that, uh, so I, I'll come back uh, to that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Could you also introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Kara. Hmm. Um, I work a little bit in um, registering people to vote here. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Two very, very good questions. So let, let me go back to to, to Sandra's question. Um, <laughs> um, well, the 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 thing is, you'd be very surprised. In fact, I was very surprised too, because I uh, I think there are two kinds of businesses uh, that I'd work. One, uh, especially the economics of conflict, because wars are not just created. Wars are also big business. And I think we, that is something that we need to really grapple with because there's economics of war. Uh, uh, and, and people, wars, not everybody lose out. That's why peace is so fragile and so difficult to kind of sustain because it's not as though everybody wants peace. Uh, because, because in a situation of warfare, then you are able to create the, the insecurities that allow you to get access to some of the, the, the resources, be it diamonds or timber or whatever. And, 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 and also many people benefit from, from the, the supply of arms, the, the, the industries and, and so on. And including some of the, of the soldiers are from, people, from, from uh, communities that can't get jobs. I mean, if you look at, uh, in fact, what was very clear to me when I was in the Great Lake region, that these are not just ordinary militias within local communities, they were transnational militias that went from one place to another creating instability. So, 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 that, so that there was a much la larger problem. And, and, and therefore, I think we need to look at the economics of warfare. Um, but, but having said that, and there's also the economics of criminality, uh, but having said that, there are also new emerging economic powers that I think are getting to be uh, to rethink the way they do business, and I, I was actually very surprised. In fact, uh, although I mean, the, the, the I, before, before this, I should say that the Secretary General had tried, because he feels that the UN is very limited. Because what what we we have been very good at has been the engaging of, of nation states, and 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 in some cases with civil society, but we have not been able to include business. Um, as a, a critical sector. And yet, if you look at, at where wealth is located in today's world, many companies own more wealth than nation states. Uh, and therefore, you one needs to really look at the, the capacity of transnational capital to destabilize states, or even to, to, to have uh, ways of, of, of engaging with states in, in very, very different ways. In other words, they have very special power. So he tried to bring them in, in terms of the global compact, now that's been highly criticized by, by, uh, by various people because what he tried to do was to create an ethics of doing business. But, there, but I have to say that there is now at least several businesses that have emerged that talk about social responsibility in doing business. And I think that's a very good, good trend. And, I, and, and we, we um, people who have the capacity of buying power, I think we have to real, realize that each one of us has certain kinds of power and can actually make a huge difference in the kind of things we buy. We can create special markets. We, we have the power of consumers and, and the power of investment. I, I know, for example, that uh, some of the faith-based organizations have been looking at how they invest, looking at ethical investment. 
making sure that, that, that their investment are not going to companies that, that are doing business in a particular way, that are not engaged with arms and so on. So I think there are, there's tremendous change and, and there's hope. I, mean, I, I was um, actually, to be honest, I'm going to, to, to Seoul because there are 800 businesses and that I'll be involved in trying to precisely engage in this kind of a conversation. Because, because I think we have to turn, not all, because we will never succeed, but at least some businesses needs to be turned around. And I, ha I have to tell you that I was um, actually uh, invited um, to be on the, on the board of, uh, and uh, maybe some of you would know, would actually know, know this, this is the, the Calvert Investment Fund. Uh, they own about 10 billion uh, worth of, of investment and they, they invited me because they want us to be a partner with them and guess what they have come up with a framework I think they may be getting a bit of a soft uh, legs because they, they suddenly realize what they are up uh, uh, what is it they are doing they didn't want to start a revolution but I think they may uh, if they push this through they, their, their framework was uh, to look at how can they use the investment to bring about gender equality and women's empowerment and there were like five principles that that, that they were looking at um, they were looking at making sure that that, that in all the, the the companies that they invested in that, that, that women will have good working conditions that that that, that they will uh, uh, they they will prevent their, their employees and their subcontractors to engage in sweatshops and so on so so I think these uh, it is a way forward I mean I am such a hopeful human being uh, and I know that there are many things that, that we can't do and we shouldn't even engage in but I think that when when there is a wave of change I mean, that is something that at least we should try until they show that they're not worth trusting but I think we have to go with some amount of trust so I think that there is some hope uh, Sandy so let's see <laughs> <laughs> and I think the um, the thing about the the U.S. and obviously, there are many people feel that it is really important for for all of you to vote. And I stop there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I have, Helene, I have about a dozen students here from my age to developing business class, and I have to ask you a question. Can I just ask them on the admission? <laughs> is this a test or what? No. <laughs> Of all the various Millennium Development Goals that exist for, um, for 2015, which do you think are the most achievable? Which is the most achievable? I mean, pragmatically on the ground, realistically. Mm. Well, I, it, it's going to be, uh, you know, the, the first one that, that was being tracked is the one of girls uh, access to secondary education by the year 2005. But that's not going, not going, going to be achieved. And, and um, they, I think to be very honest, uh, if you, it will be achieved in, at different levels. And because if you talk about having the world's absolute poverty by the year 2015, if you look at global, uh, at poverty at a global level, the fact that you have China and a high growth rate and India and a high growth rate, in that sense, the world's level of poverty would have decreased because these are the, the, the two countries that have huge uh, population of the world's poor and, are, and, and is at, at a high growth uh, level that have trickled down, basically. But then if you look at uh, uh, poverty in a different way, you look at where is it concentrated, like in Africa, and you look at some of the breakdown states and so on, they are not going to halve their, their, their poverty. So that, so that you need to look at all these goals in a very different light. I mean, these, these are mobilizing goals, basically. I mean, they are goals that, that gives you a direction on where, what it is really is to try to bring the donor community together and hold them accountable. And, and what, is it, what is being held accountable? Who and what is, is happening with these goals? They're very interesting. Because it's almost like the Secretary General's uh, attempt to create an alternative uh, development framework. Because, for example, uh, the bank would come in with their PRSPs, and for the, the, that is like uh, World Bank speakers, the Poverty Reduction Strategy, right? So, so they would come in, and it's almost like uh, they, they would then say that, okay, you will have to cut this, 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 this. But if, if the countries develop a and this is all supposed to be a nationally owned strategy, but of course it's not because there are conditionalities. So, 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 so increasingly the countries will have, 
uh, even if they say, all right, this is our strategy to, to, uh, to uh, kind of cut our poverty by half, the bank will say, but you don't have the economics to make that happen, and therefore you have to redefine everything, and these are the areas in which you have to cut. So it's not very different from the structural adjustment programs in, in, in different ways. Now, now, now the, because the UN and all the donors are engaged in the PRSPs, and because there is now international commitment to bring about the Millennium Development Goals, you put at the base of that, of the PR, PRSPs, your MDGs, your, 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 your goals, and say, you know what, the role of all of us is to uh, realize these goals, and therefore you can't cut here, you can't cut there. So it becomes a negotiation. So that's really what it's all about, to, to be very honest. And that's where it is the politics of the, of the, of the Millennium Development Goals. Uh, would you introduce us? Sorry, my name is Elaine Walters. And from when? From Eugene, yeah. uh, domestic violence work. Uh -huh. Many women won't even use the word kind of fundamentalism anymore. They will use it as extremisms, right? Yeah, of different sorts. Huh? And 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 really, um, uh, I think uh, what um, many uh, groups have done is to reinterpret. In other words, they 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 try very hard to reinterpret the the uh, sacred texts. They have tried to to mobilize in different ways. They have, uh, uh, they have, I mean, like, like, uh, what, like the case of uh, of Afghanistan is a very good case. That that it does not mean that 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 because you have an Islamic state that, that it has to be the Taliban type of, of of Islamic state. So that you you have women who have engaged with what uh, Islam, the diversity. Uh, within within Islam and to show uh, the modern practices and 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 that was that is a challenging that uh, you uh, to 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 show that that at the end of the day nobody wins in terms of, of these extremisms but at the same time it is not just Islamic but it's also Christian fundamentalist uh, extremisms it is uh, uh, Hindu uh, extremisms it is um, uh, Buddhist extremism so extremism it can, it can also be economic extremism. Uh, and secular extremism of, of different sorts. So, so I think one we, we <laughs> where so so that we 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 we, we need to really uh, realize that nobody wins uh, when when we go to the extremes and the, the, the wars we are having today are wars of the, the two extremes.